name, Lord, just thank you for this night, for this bless, for these blessings that we have to, to gather. Lord, thank you for these fellows that um, take a little time out of their day to, to come um, listen to someone speak about you and your word. God, I ask that um, as I um, teach, God, that there'll just be something that uh, strikes each one of them. Um, let them take something away, God. I just ask that um, you just let me be you somehow, some way, as, as I present, God. And thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first thing um, I'll say is, this is not my forte, so I will, as I was preparing and as I do this, the guys that get up, especially on the big stage, and do this weekly, kudos. Um, I'm more impressed having done this. So anyway, um, I'm kind of calling this, as I was just reading over my notes today, um, Put a note on the top of this called carrot and stick because as you read through this as we go through this and if we as we seen last week joshua was telling them god's been good god's done these things because you've been in part obedient you continue on this will probably continue to happen and if you don't this is what will happen um, so there's uh, the opportunity for good things or bad things, thus carrot and the stick. And I mentioned last week uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, um, and we'll start there. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before us, or set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for considering him, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. So we all run a race. Israel, Jews ran a race. Um, the question is, why do you run? How do you run? And ultimately, how do you finish? Israel, as we've seen in Joshua, and, and frankly, even past that, they're a good example, and quite frankly, a horrible example of what can happen when we are obedient to God in his word versus when we are disobedient while in the process of running a race. And so Joshua, with basically what were his last words, um, he was in essence encouraging Israel to run the ways well as he leaves the scene. Verse 9 of Joshua. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, not one has been able to stand against you to this day. Verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. So as we remember, Canaan was full of the enemies of Israel who would ultimately all need to be defeated. Israel was not prepared, having just come out of the wilderness, was really not prepared for what was in front of them. Um, but God, uh, God was. Um, Jericho was one of the cities they, uh, they took at the beginning, and frankly is a great example of that, because as you recall, their only instruction was march around the city one time, six different days. Seventh day, go around it seven times, blow a horn, walls fall. Yay team. They did nothing, really, but were obedient. <clears throat> Martin Luther once said, with God, one is a majority. And I think we can agree that at Jericho, God was the majority. The people learned this as they conquered all the land God had promised. As he was with Israel, so he would be with us, and perhaps even more so as we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us as a Christian. Matthew 28, 20 closes with this. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Amen. He will fight our battles too. We are more than conquerors with Christ. as we read in Romans 8:37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him 
who loved us. <clears throat> Verses, uh, verse 11. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. So here Joshua is encouraging and cautioning at the same time um, Israel of their need to love God. As we know, frankly, this is an act of the will. Once we choose love, feelings will eventually follow. As we have probably each experienced, feelings can lie. <clears throat> for Joshua, as for us, it really comes down to one thing. Do we love the Lord our God? Our actions will demonstrate who and what we love. Ultimately, we obey, honor, serve, and are kind to whom and to what we love. What do your finances say about who you love? What does your time say about what you love? Remember, there are consequences for failing to love the Lord our God. Perhaps while Joshua was speaking Israel to Israel, um, as he was making his last speech, they were recalling the words from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, which is, Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your home, when you walk by your way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Verse 7, frankly, is making it pretty apparent that we should embrace his word completely in all aspects of our life. Um, we don't just come here on Thursdays. We don't just come here on Tuesdays. Um, we don't just come here on Sundays. We need to be in the word. We need to be in prayer. Um, frankly, the Bible talks about praying without ceasing. Um, his word should be ever before us. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But what are we doing with it? The Lord demands and demanded supreme place in the hearts of his people. As an example, and considering we are the bride of Christ, the bridegroom in the Song of Solomon, uh, in 8, chapter 8, verses 6 through 7, asks that the heart of his bride be sealed against all intruders. This shows the character of love for her. He indicated his love was as strong as death <clears throat> and would overcome any obstacle to make its claim. And when I read that, I was, I was frankly, it's as strong as death. And I don't know why, but it struck me as strong as death. He died, which showed ultimate love for us. Um, anyway, <clears throat> and his jealousy refused to relinquish what he had once possessed. His love burned as a fire kindled by the flame of Jehovah. It was unquenchable. To love the Lord our God with all our hearts. We're to reciprocate the love with all of our hearts. 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. <clears throat> we should close our hearts to everything unworthy of Jesus. In Matthew 22.37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Verse 12. Or else, indeed, if you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, that they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your side, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from the good land which the Lord your God has given you. As you recall, they were to go in, they were to, to, to strike all the nations, defeat them. Frankly, they were to be God's tool of judgment, as we talked about in, in earlier um, um, Tuesday nights. Um, But while they went to rest, there was more to do, and there was more people around, and Joshua, as he's getting ready to leave the scene, knows that there's more to do, and he's looking around saying, hey guys, there's all kinds of stuff around here. We're not, we're to be, we're not to be intermingling with them. We're not to be marrying with them, because he knows if you do that, you're gonna pick up their ways. Um, so he, he's just, he's warning them. 
So verse 9 through 11 talks about what the Lord has done for them and will continue to do them as a result of obedience and loving the Lord their God. This is the promise of the reward, or as I'm saying, the carrot. We get victory, we get comfort, and we get honor. And verses 12 and 13 remind Israel of what the consequences of disobedience are. The stick. Their defeat, discomfort, and disgrace. Joshua says and tells them, hey guys, you followed until now. Continue to follow and go forward. Just because I'm leaving the scene doesn't mean you stop doing what you're doing. He was encouraging them in their faith. Something we should be doing with our brothers and sisters here. We should be encouraging each other in our faith as well. He knew just like today, there was temptation and was going to be a temptation all around him. The reality is this, it is hard to take the world out of the followers of Christ. We read in Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to the, this world, but be renewed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And then Paul reminds us to be separate. 2 Corinthians six seventeen. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. In Joshua's appeal, he's looking to reason with the elders as to why they should cleave or adhere to the law and love the Lord. If you recall, God had called Abraham um, from idolatry um, as his father's fathers served other gods. Just like he called Abraham before we were saved, we were all idolaters. Uh, idolaters. Probably the number one idol was ourselves. Um, <laughs> frankly, if we're all honest, that's what we struggle with most is getting over ourself. Um, because we want what feels good for us, what's good for us, what makes us happy. Um, and I don't want to say the heck with other people, because hopefully we're not, we're not quite there. But on a bad day, we might say the heck with other people. I don't know. Um, but that's not a good thing. We're not to be that way. So God wanted to use Abraham and ultimately Israel as a testimony to the one true God and frankly, the one true way. As God called them to be an example in the world, he is calling us to be that same example in our world today. Begs the question, are you the same person at work as you are at church? <clears throat> Do people see and hear you such that they know you to be a Christian? What would people say you worshiped? And then Pastor David, I've heard him say this a couple times. Um, if you were go, to go on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Hopefully so. Joshua knew preservation from idolatry was only available through obedience to God's law. Why is Joshua so insistent for loyalty and love to God? Frankly, I think it's this. He was aware of the human tendencies. Um, we tend to want to wander. Well, when we're apart from God as, as unbelievers, we're definitely wandering in disobedience. But even as, as Christians, sometimes, if we're not careful, if we're not um, persistent and diligent in prayer and in meeting with brothers and sisters, staying in the word, we tend to wander away. So sadly, without the indwelling intervention of the Holy Spirit, human nature changes very little. <clears throat> Job 25.4 says, How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Romans 7.18, I know that in me dwells no good thing. Hebrews 3, verse 12 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, heart, an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. The sooner that we acknowledge this and admit our weakness, the sooner the hope of blessing and stability. <clears throat> What's our one hope? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. We should love God because he loved us. He's faithful, he's kind, and he's merciful. He spared Israel 
often. From punishment they justly deserved, he was merciful and lavished them with much grace. Thankfully, he does the very same thing for us today. Verse 14. Behold this day, I am going the way of all the earth. This is Joshua continuing. And you know in your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass. Not one word of them has failed. So the first thing that caught me is, behold, I'm going the way of the earth. Surprise, I'm going to die. Are you guys awake? Listen, please, and remember. Joshua claimed God had not failed them, and this was true. He knew they were aware of this in their heart of hearts. If God spoke good, and good things occurred concerning them, then what about what he speaks to us? Timothy says, all scripture is God-inspired and God-breathed. As we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in, right in righteousness. His words are meant for our good. So if we listen and abide by his word, it will go well for us. Verse 15. Therefore, it shall come to pass, that as all good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God had promised you. So in verse 14, Joshua had reminded Israel of all the good things that God had promised and that he had delivered on. He promised them a land of, of milk and honey. He got it, or they got it. He promised that they would defeat everyone. As long as they were walking in obedience, that occurred. God had not failed them. Now here in verse 15, Joshua is reminding him these promises are conditional. With their actions, Israel had a choice of receiving God's blessings or his cursing. The land was unconditional, and it was a gift as part of the covenant God made with Abraham. However, tenure of that land was conditional. Through disobedience, they would not be able to dwell in the land. See how they... Um, And we'll read um, Judges 2, 10 through 15, after Joshua leaves the scene, and we'll see about the, the choices that, that they make. <clears throat> when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all among them. They bowed down to them. They provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. So one thing I forgot to mention before that's, that's kind of here. So as the, the generation passed, the next generation decided to do it their own way, which ultimately wasn't going to work well for them until they came back and repented. Then it didn't work out for them. They repented again. Um, but it talks about uh, earlier teacher children. So I know a lot of us have kids. Some of us, you know, they're, they've moved on. Um, but it's our responsibility to teach our children um, because one day we're going to leave here and hopefully what we've instilled in our children um, will be such that, that even if they've wandered off for a time, that they'll come back and they'll have one of the V8 moments and say, ah, oh, yeah, my dad, my mom told me about this. And they'll turn and repent. And just like Israel, even though they ran and they ran hard, they came back and, and kind of like the prodigal son, right? The prodigal, the prodigal son comes back and the father didn't make him do all kinds of stuff to get back in good graces. He went and threw a robe on him. Let's have a party. Let's do the pig. Let's I mean let's let's just have a rose. Let's let's just um, let's just let's just party on. So, um, as we continue, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers, who just 
who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around. And I think I said pig. I'm in the south, so I'm just thinking barbecue. So, um, so, so they could no longer stand before their enemies. Whatever, whenever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity. In the Lord, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. This kind of reminds me of, it's not always the case, but sometimes God trying to get you back on page will just allow a constant beatdown. That's not always the case, because sometimes you're being tested for another reason. Sometimes God just wants you back, and he's going to be like, you know what, I'll let you have it. Go on your way, see how it works out for you, till you get to a place where it's like, okay, God, I get it. He's not going to make you. Um, he's not going to make you say yes or say yes for you, but he can definitely put you in a place where the only answer is is yes, which is a good thing. And as we'll see later, and I was talking to Steve on the way in, um, you know, they were expelled from the land over and over. Um, and instead of rinse and repeat, it was repent and repeat. In 722, the Assyrians came in, took over. 605, 597, and 586, the Babylonians. Um, then Antiochus Epiphanes in 165, and then the Romans in 70 AD. Um, they were being judged. They, they wanted to do it their own way. God let them do it their own way. And their own way was similar to what happened with Egypt. They were in bondage. Um, like, if you want bondage, I'll give you bondage. If we want to choose bondage, on some levels, God will allow us to make our own decisions and live a life that is not filled with a whole lot of joy um, because we're in a spiral. Um, before I came to this church, um, I was in a spiral, and I won't get into to details here, but in a spiral um, such that, and I think this, this is what happens to them. You know, we can choose God and choose joy and, and walk kind of like this. You know, at a high level, maybe there'll be some dips. Or if we do it our own way, um, it's kind of a, a, a spiral. So you're on top when you're doing stupid stuff because it makes you feel good for a minute. And then, because the enemy's on your shoulder saying, yeah, that'll make you feel good. Yeah, that, that's good. You deserve it or whatever. And then you go there, and then you have God or the Holy Spirit or just frankly your conscience saying, or the enemy saying, what were you thinking? Call yourself a Christian? Really? That's what you're going to do? And so you start, you start doing this thing where you have a high, then you have a low, then you have a high that's not as high, but the low is much lower. And for me, quite frankly, I got to a place where I'd had enough, and it was either God or my life, quite frankly. I'd had enough. So luckily, um, and it's weird, God gives you the easy button over and over and over again, and I'm glad he chased me. Um, and it's weird as I think about the last event, um, just before I lost my job, I had one more opportunity for the easy button, and I said, not going to take it. I'm going to continue on my journey. And two days later, knock on the door, here's your pink slip. He kind of had my attention at that point. So um, it was an odd two years without a job, um, but it was also a good thing. <clears throat> so have you forsaken the Lord for some idol? Is the anger of the Lord turned against you? Remembering that just because bad things are happening to you doesn't mean God's... There, there are a lot of reasons why we could run into circumstances that aren't, aren't uh, what we would, would prefer. Are you following in step with the world? If you're walking lockstep with the world, it's probably long-term not going to work well for you. Verse 16. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. So what have we learned? God's word is true. What he says, he'll do. 
Um, when, he makes, when, he, when he makes a promise to us, when he makes a covenant with us, that will never change. Um, the question that we should ask is, do we really love him? It is from this that all blessings flow. I'm just, as I'm reading this, by the fruits, um, you'll know them. What's our fruits? Because if we're not bearing any fruit, I would make argument that maybe there's not a lot of love there because that's where, that's where you know, that's where you get your strength to, to, do, to, do, um, to do his will and be his hands and feet. When he warns us toward, when he warns us toward obedience, it is far good because not following in, in obedience comes with consequences. He doesn't want to have to discipline us. Um, he doesn't like to see us fall. Um, he wants only good for us. Um, but as we make bad choices, sometimes those are going to come with, not always, thankfully, um, just consequences that we'll, that we'll have to uh, walk away with. And even when you do walk away with consequences, just thinking again back to me, there's consequences of my actions, but the cool thing is um, he'll help you deal with those. He'll help those around you deal with those. Um, because sometimes, like I said, the consequences, are there, sometimes they're there, and you just, you know, they can be a, a, a burden. Um, and sometimes we're supposed to lay stuff at the cross. It's a good place to put it. Sometimes we like to go over there and pick a few things up and put it in our backpack and try to walk around with it a little bit more. Um, not a good idea, so sometimes, you know, we got to learn, go back, go back and, and, and back. So it's a, it's a learned thing. God will not allow those he loves to wander forever. The Lord shows his love to the one he loves because he chastens them. Like Israel, God is always ready for us to repent, and as we do, we are welcomed back to him and are allowed once again uh, to bask in his love and his blessings. So I would just, um, I would just say in, in closing, you know, if, if you've wandered, you've got an opportunity to come back. Um, if, you're, if your life is filled with idols, lay them down. You know, even if they're not filled, right? What's our number one priority? God loving God. Anything else that we're picking up, carrying around that, that even for a moment is uh, above God, that's an idol. We need to repent and walk away from that. Um, and ultimately, doing it his way is, is where joy is going to come from. Um, doing it our own way, um, it'll be a roller coaster. And that's not, that's not fun for anybody. Not long term. So, thank you.